Well, thank you for coming to my defense. My name is Chris Persina. In case you haven't already had the pleasure of meeting me, um, lots of people say thank you to. Uh, many of you are in this room. Too many to list even on this, uh, this slide. Um, for some of you that are at uh, attending remotely, um, to give you a quick background, um, I'm part of the third lab, and we like making um, educational tools. Uh, we're part of the CS department in the human computer interaction field, uh, but our lab specifically uh, enjoys looking at th uh, problems with uh, empathic views or uh, empathic design with empathy and giving agency back to the, uh, to the users. And in one of our other projects, we, had, we came upon this problem that students are continually failing fra uh, to learn fractions. And for many different reasons, some of the examples you can see on the screen. And unfortunately, especially in the US, often the case, if you fail, the standard response by the school system is to just give you more instruction of the exact same thing. So if you didn't understand it the first time, luckily you get it a second, a third, or a fourth time. And sometimes, uh, as with the case of many of the participants in our study uh, that we're going to talk about today, you got double helpings of that same instruction. So that's like beating a dead horse, and it's not uh, approach we want uh, to continue down that road. So what we tried to do is we looked at what the students were doing and they were very disengaged and they were actually just tapping on the desk during the math class. And it shows that they're disengaged in math but they're engaged in music making and drumming. So they're off in their own um, dream world doing what they want to do. So that's our approach. We're going to take this music, um, then we made a curriculum and a complementary web application that go together with the music to teach fractions. So our motivation, today we're going to talk about the motivation, some of our research questions, the two most important parts of this uh, study, which are the curriculum and the interface, the, the web interface that we made. Uh, we're going to talk to you about our participants, some of the data that we collected, and how we analyzed that data. So when the students were tapping on their um, on the desk, and they're not paying attention to the math, we really wanted to capture that. So we created this prototype that you can see on the right screen. And it has multiple instruments, and it's somewhat like a beatbox machine, if you're familiar with that, where you click on the, uh, the different beats, and they turn them on and off. So the, and the orange are on in this case, and the blue are off in this case. And then it kind of, in this version, it auto-calculates <coughs> how many are on and how many are off. And then we have some other features that can uh, change the rhythm. But unfortunately, we were like, when we went to teach to the students who were loving this, want to click all day, we're like, today we're going to learn. Wait a second. We don't really know how to, the right question to ask them to make it meaningful for them. So we kind of had to start over, and we needed a curriculum to go along with that. So the research questions for this study are how can a micro world that utilizes multiple representations provide learning resources to address student misconceptions? The second one is how can a musical approach to fraction learning help students progress in their composition, comprehension, and communication? And the third one is how do multiple interactive, 
culturally relevant activities affect engagement in this learning environment. So I'm going to talk about the interface that we made. And you can see it here on the left. There's made up of three instruments. The third one isn't, um, doesn't have any representations because they're not using it in this uh, screenshot. The first one has all of our representations with five beats alternating, uh, starting with the first one on. The second instrument, the snare, has four instruments. Four beats. Four, four beats, correct. So the first instrument, if you were to tap that out, it would sound like this. So the red's the first, and then it goes around the circle, or if you're looking at the number line representation, the red's the first, and then it goes left to right. It's important to look at this because it's a graphical representation of what you hear. So um, we have this uh, consideration for math and all the things that uh, encompass fractions. What do they look like? What do they really mean? There's just the generally abstract idea of the parts and the holes. The music, right? That's what the kids want to do. They want to create music. It doesn't, doesn't want to be drumming. It also wants to be on the cymbal or the hi-hat or the kick drum. And then we also had to add in other elements for our study so that we can keep track of what each user, who they are, what they're doing, what they're not doing. And it has to be, it has to look good. If the students don't know what to do either if it's not, if the interface doesn't make sense to them, it's not going to be approachable. So let's talk about the representations we have. The first one, the audio, you can kind of think of this like a metronome. Um, it flashes whenever a beat plays or when we have this uh, additional functionality that we allow, that the first prototype did, didn't have, we allow the students to tap in their own rhythm, and the sound of fractions will record that and do beat analysis and make a, rep a graphical representation based on that. So if they're tapping that, that most likely sound of fractions would interpret that as four beats, all turned on, and approximately the same uh, circumference uh, that you see. So the audio representation helps the student take whatever is in their mind and, and also embodied, this embodied and trained um, feeling, and represent it graphically. That kind of helps them understand the other representations that we have, which we call the core four. The line, the pi, and the bar, those are pretty traditional mathematical representations. You'll see this in any standard um, textbook uh, or testing. But our novel contribution is the bead. It's modeled after rosary beads or necklaces. And it has a whole bunch of properties that we'll get, uh, we'll get into. But if you were to hit play on the sound of fractions, this is what you would see. And it doesn't want to play. That's because it knows that you're. Yes. Because uh, yesterday this worked. <laughs> <laughs> it wants to think. Chris. Yes, it's always the way. New words and covers, right? <clears throat> Best guesses. There we are. Audio. Mm -hmm. I don't want it. I want internal. There we go. 
This is really neat. The red beat is the red beat is the red beat is the red beat. The first beat is the first beat is the first beat is the first beat. The second beat is the second beat is the second beat. If it's on in one, it's on in the other. If it's off in one representation, it's off in the other. This can go on forever. And many of the students do enjoy listening to it play repeatedly. But how do you move between the representations? Say I have a pi, and I want it to be a number line. The pi has this neat feature. It kind of talks about duration as well as the bar. It, it takes up physical space. The number line and the bead, the elements are the same regardless of the count. So if there's one bead on a necklace, it's still just one circle that's eight pixels wide the number line is always 20 pixels tall. So it highlights division. The only way you understand how long it is playing is by the length or the circumference, but how many there are is better understood by focusing on how many uh, separations or divisions there are. These are very different things, even though they're still playing the same sound, and they somewhat look the same with color, but they take other representational forms. So there's some things that are the same, some things that are the different, that are different. What we want to do is help the students realize that fractions can help explain these abstract ideas, especially what's the same. So we created this ability to transition from any of the core four to the other. And I'm going to hit play in a second, and they're all going to start going. So it looks crazy when you see them all, so choose your favorite. But if you want to look at what a pie looks like to a bead, look at this one. And it's going to, it's going to transition, and then it's going to transition back. So while they're transitioning, our goals, which are also kind of highlighted in the static representation on the left screen, is to keep the colors the same, to keep the order the same, to keep the count the same, to keep their uh, state the same if it's on or off throughout the representation, or transition. This really helps students understand that it is the same thing. You can look at these online uh, as well uh, on the specialarts.org slash thesis. Then we have this neat thing, okay, what is it that we're talking about? Well, we question, we propose to the students to start labeling what they see. But the students start realizing you can label the same thing multiple ways or multiple things the same. And this is really interesting because especially in, in the first group, they started getting confused because they're, wait, what were you talking about? What were you talking about? Wait, you were talking about the same thing and so I had to create this matrix on a, on a whiteboard, um, and this is, uh, represents it on, on the main screen. And so they started to understand that you can describe the order, the quantity, the size, the duration, or the type. And then within each of those, you can describe the parts or the holes. So here, if we wanted to take, to describe the size and the part, they realize they can even describe the parts in two different ways. How big they are by themselves, or how big they are in relation to the whole. So they could label each beat either one, or they could label each beat one fifth. And there's many other examples. Here are some examples of the students. And Latasha does something extremely amazing on the very last day is, uh, when we introduce uh, labeling. And she takes what's on the first, the third, and the fifth, and she breaks that into its own whole and labels them one third, one third, and one third. And then the two that are off, she breaks that into a completely separate whole and labels those half and half. This is, uh, in the mathematical schema literature, is one of the most complex things that lets us know that they're starting to understand fractions. If she does it more and more frequently, then we can 
be better able or better poised to say that she understands fractions. <clears throat> so that's the interface. Now we're going to talk about the curriculum. Both the curriculum and the interface were developed in parallel. <clears throat> we didn't just create an interface and then come up with the curriculum or vice versa. We made certain elements, asked questions, how do we uh, want to implement them? Or we said we had questions and we said, how do we make this uh, possible in an interface? In general, the curriculum follows, each activity follows the idea of doing, asking, and take away. So first, the students are challenged to do something. Then we ask them questions. And the majority of ours are open-ended. This really lets us understand the mental acrobatics that are going on inside. So we can sometimes delve further into the, uh, those answers, especially when we know that they're hurdles. And then, like many learning uh, curriculum, we want them to take away. Sometimes we have a task that we ask questions multiple times, two and three times. You can see the full curriculum on the website, um, <clears throat> but we do have a blank lesson plan here, and then this is from day three, activity three, and you can notice that there's three activities that we did. So what did we do in the curriculum? So it was made up for six days, and that was our initial uh, thing. We'll get up, uh, the next slide. I'll talk about what actually ended up happening. Uh, one of the groups ended up going with seven days. But in general, we have this creation stage, this identification phase, and this manipulation phase. There are elements of each in each stage, but ultimately we want them to create something. Then we want to focus on identifying the parts within them, and then we want them to change it up. So in the creation phase, one of the uh, really neat activities we had, to, we had them do was create a rhythm tapping it and then make a physical representation using crafting material so that when it was handed to someone else, one of their uh, fellow students, they would have to recreate that rhythm by interpreting that representation. <clears throat> Later on, we start to ask, what is it? How many parts are there? What's the whole? And then we start changing it up and we do the transitions. And again, throughout each of those stages, we're still asking them to identify, and there may be manipulation. But it's through these uh, scaffolded stages that it really uh, starts to work with curriculum that has been shown to work with some of the uh, leading edge mathematical literature. So our main study, we had two groups. One was at a school, one was at an after school program sixth and seventh graders. Um, there were some additional students, but if they were only able to participate one day, we didn't really um, uh, include them in this data. <clears throat> Part of the problem that we're looking at with students that, have, that do struggle with fractions, especially that they're low SES, socioeconomic <clears throat> status, they have attendance problems. And it shows in our data that not every, there were, there was no single student that attended every single session. Um, many missed uh, two and sometimes three. So that's a challenge that we have to face, but we still have some promising data that we'll go over shortly. And then our first group had about a lead time of about two weeks. So that uh, helps explain some of the variance between what happened in group one and what happened in group two because I, uh, I was able to adjust their curriculum on the fly. So we collected a whole bunch of data, just absolutely crazy. Every, every study does. What's important to know is the four different data types that we have. We have video, log, notebooks, and artwork. The video is the, um, cam the video camcorder and static ca uh, cameras images of them performing uh, during the study. The logs are when they're only operating with the sound of fractions. The first two days 
we didn't even introduce the sound of fractions. Those were more focused on drumming activities, collaboration, and discussion, more embodied approaches, not so much tech, uh, technology assisted. So once they are in the, um, operating with the sound of fractions, we want to know who it is, what they do. We keep it in uh, quite simple sentential form. There's an example. And then there's the actual JSON data structure of their rhythm once they've performed the action. And that allows us to do some pretty things. There are notebooks. Um, they're physical, but we took pictures. Uh, you can navigate their data on, online as well. Uh, here, this is the very first uh, activity that we start off with. What is a fraction? You can see it's very terse. It's not really meaningful. Um, and it doesn't really speak uh, to what a fraction is. Um, a neat thing, I'll, I'll go ahead and mention, if you ever have kids and you want to talk about fractions, the literature and my study highly suggest avoid talking about halves. Students are, the kids already get that immediately from birth. And there's complications when you talk about half. We'll, we'll even show you an example later. But I'll talk about something other than a half. So it's funny that they want to say a fraction is a half, and they feel that they know fractions. And then the artwork. So those representations that the students made of their rhythms, this is one of the most complex, uh, and it has recursive elements in it. Basically, the student is saying, after I go one step to your right, take the pipe cleaner back and keep doing this. Very, very uh, interesting. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. They do understand that it is important. That's clear. The question is, uh, what, why do they think, or what domain they think it's important? About 30 to 40 percent of them realize it's important in cooking and food. Um, and then there's, of course, the rest. Everyone says it's an important in math. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, talking about the video data, um, it's very rich, very rich in data. Uh, we talked about the problems with students coming and going, even during the session, especially in the, um, in the school, they get called into the office and return. So it's hard to keep track with from an analytical standpoint of what each student has been exposed to because sometimes they're absent for uh, sub-activities or activities. So I created this way of documenting it. Um, on the main screen, that's the, uh, the legend. So you can see, if you look vertically, you can see what's happening in a particular activity. Or you can follow a student's um, learning progression by following that stu student uh, horizontally. And you can look at it from a high level by day. So the yellowish gold is group one, and the uh, teal is group two. And then you can see that in group two's first day, it has a certain amount of time. There were four main activities that have meaningful uh, contributions. If you were to then follow group one's activity three, or in day three, so not this one, but their first activity, these are all the things that happened during that activity with the sub-activities, the questions we asked from the do, ask, take away. This is the doing and the asking parts. And then the relevant information. It has a temporal element, so things that happened first are on your left and things that happened are on your right, and linking to talk about students that are interacting with. And we have a separation with a solid line meaning this means to a particular student, and if it's hashed, it's more general. The video data is available up here as well if you would like to uh, take one and uh, look through. The log data. Um, this is more quantitative, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but for you quant people out there, I'm going to tell you what the logs show. Students love rhythms that have more beats, clear as day. The four and the five, those were the default uh, um, signatures of the rhythms when they created the rhythm graphically and didn't tap it in. But look all the way to the right, 16. They love going and pushing the limits. We do 
uh, require a rhythm to have one. So they tried to delete, but you can't have a rhythm without zero. And uh, that also has some important mathematical um, <laughs> reasoning behind it as well. When they did record, it was typically very short, under four seconds. A third of them were determined to be complex by either the number of beats or their beat sizes. Um, we have some math that shows some pretty interesting stuff about that as well. Most of them use one instrument, but there's a pretty solid linear, um, a linear consistency that shows that people still want to use uh, two and three. The bead was used the most, and we didn't, oh, we didn't tell them it had to. Whenever we said make a bead, they're free to add a bead or a bead. A bead, a bead representation. They're free to add other representation types. Um, even in the questions that I asked them, I said, which one do you want to work with? And if they didn't want to work with the bead, fine. We'll work with the pie. That's where they want to, I'll meet them where they want to be. Uh, the representations were transitioned up to seven times. So if you look at that one representation in that box, they transitioned that seven times, up to seven times consistently. Um, two through seven. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting that they want to see it transition that many times, which is different than just creating another one side by side. And then students operate with a scale rhythm. Another thing I, I forgot to mention is that you can stretch the representations or shrink them. Stretching it makes it longer, and shrinking it makes the duration shorter. So, yes? Why would somebody want to use more than one kind of representation? Uh, do you require them to do that? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, the initial response and motivation for the student to add a different is because it's there. So what, during the first part, where we provide, they, we give them like a, a primer day, have at it, just do what you want to do. It's cool to see the things. Um, why do we want them to? Do I think it? I know why you want them to. Okay. But did your curriculum require them to, or you just wanted to see if they would on their own? Uh, initially, we wanted to see if they would on their own. Okay. By day four is when we start to uh, ask them, and we focus on the B and the line, specifically those two, because they're divisional, which is harder. They're the same, so the B is what we want and has uh, other properties we want to. So the, the linear form of the, of the B is the line. And so there were three activities that we explicitly called those out. Chris, but I think you were saying something more than that. You were saying, yes, they, we required it at times, but they also did it themselves. Yes, also say yes. They also did it themselves, which implies a kind of playing or curiosity or trying to see what it is that, they're sh that the representation is showing. But the key point of the law is, of course, they were really interested in the transition between the two, not, not right. seeing the parallels, but just seeing the I mean, that's pretty interesting. Which is Yes, they do. Uh, that is that is a contribution of ours. That uh, in any language, uh, it's hard to even describe searching it. That code did not exist, um, and so uh, our approach, uh, which is implemented in D three, um, is open source now as well. Was that six months? Six months of yeah, implementation yeah. problems. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, um, there's an interesting crowdsourcer who, who has a mechanical Turk problem where he asks people to draw one sheet facing to the left. And out of 10,000 responses, he gets one that says, why? <laughs> and, and so I post this question in a, in a um, Stack Overflow in Open Community to ask, how do I even approach this? He, I can draw it, I can show you what I want to do, but when my programming skills don't even know how to approach it, I just need guidance in that. So one of the uh, best D3 persons in the community is like, I have no clue why you want to do this, but this looks interesting. So we have stayed in communication and he, he, he enjoys it. So one of the other types of uh, data are the notebooks. Um, 
we distributed them daily, collected them. Um, they were allowed to write in them. Many of them did take notes. Uh, and we did prompt them for answers. Over time, their notes became longer, more detailed, and more precise. And here you can see an example of Jamie's um, answer to what a fraction is. Without even reading it, you can see one's short and one's long. The important parts uh, that you can read in here is that, so her first question is that a couple of numbers that you have to solve. Um, <laughs> that's very in line with what um, many of the students describe it as a problem. And then her um, answer later, the first half is a more mathematical definition. It's stronger than the first, but not extremely robust. The latter half are her explaining fractions in terms of sound of fractions. So she's using our uh, representations, our interface, to help try and explain the relationship between the parts of the whole. And then the fourth and final type of data is the artwork. Um, it's pretty consistent that they use vertical elements, straws, um, pipe cleaners, tongue depressors, colored or not. Uh, most of the uh, artifacts we had, we had both in colored and non-colored uh, non versions. They, but they were presented in a linear fashion. Um, the students understood space, but many of them uh, in between the elements, but they had varying opinions as to what that mean, means. And then, uh, very interesting, Latasha and Alexis are in two different groups, or uh, one is in each group, but they both uh, thought that the cotton ball would, rec uh, would resemble a rest, and that was my initial idea when I was walking around the store choosing what items to purchase for the students to make. I came up with that. It's very neat to think that the students also uh, thought the same. And then, um, these three also kind of show this third dimension that many of the students want to, uh, to use, uh, often to talk about intensity and um, pitch. Pitch is something that we do not uh, account for in the sound of fractions. What is the rhythm associated with Latasha's? <laughs> so, so it's bimodal. Right, um, so by, by manual. By manual. Um, and then she orders them uh, with numbers to tell you which order. And then the, uh, this is actually a stack of sticky notes. Uh, I, this mind boggling that so many students did it. They did not take one off. They're like, oh, I'm going to use that stack. So that's what she used. Uh, and then uh, this one in the middle is her attempting to use two different Play-Dohs to say to tap at the same time. Tap both hands at the same time. This is Lata the same Latasha that had a problem with uh, defining fractions, but then provided the one-third, 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 and the half and the half. So she made excellent progress. Uh, one of the five students who clearly made progress throughout. So we have all this data, what do we do with it? So we started looking for themes. All of these themes are here, um, and they fit within that column, but uh, obviously presentation space won't allow for it. Then we started to say, okay, is this theme that we saw in one of the data sources present in, it, in the others? So that's kind of the reason we have this chart is to look at each data source and say, is this thing present? Not just is it present, let's try and give it a basic rating. Three for very strongly present, two for somewhat, one for weak, and zero for it's not present at all. If you look at it vertically, that tells us that the video is the most robust um, data source. Great. The artwork is as well, and then the notebooks and the logs seem to be the same. But then if you look at it horizontally, you can say, is this theme strong in our study? This is ordered by strength, 
So the things we want to teach the students are very strongly present. That's great. But I talked earlier about what our lab likes to do, and very much like uh, the crowdsourcer who, who encountered the person that said, why are you doing this? That's still a very important reason. So we still have to look at this. Now, predominantly, these are mathematical schema and music-related themes. They might be low because we're not music experts, we're not math experts. But one of them is gustatory, which only has a rating of five. So things that are related to taste. I had to look that up. Yeah, <laughs> olfactory is the other word I learned, and that's things related to smell. Things related to smell are not present in uh, this at all. Yes. Yeah. So these themes, you knew I was going to ask about this. Right. These themes are, they primarily come from the outside. They're not generated from user behavior. Um, many of them come from uh, aspects of what we believe we were doing. Uh, so um, uh, because we have colors in the interface, we're interested in whether they, there's some talk about color frame. Some of them come from the math learning literature. Yes. But the fraction learning literature, probably the most modern aspect of what we understand about fractions, is the notion that of the unit fraction as a multipliable, I'm trying to put this in terms, I think very hard to talk about even, but as a multipliable entity. So you describe something as a fifth, and uh, but that fifth, you're seeing at the same time that fifth as a portion of something which might be five fifths, but might be seven fifths or nine fifths, and you're thinking about that at the same time. Right? And what I, I don't see that here, it, and I wouldn't expect it to arise explicitly, but I would expect it to rise implicitly out of the embodiment of the, the, the part of a fraction as, um, uh, as an entity in a larger um, movement. I did not take the themes and join them as, a, as they're applied. Right. So the components that you're talking about are like the splitting loop, the EPS, and the puffs. Those are the mathematical schemas that she's talking about when we're talking about iteration or partitioning and kind of how the, the way a math problem can, a few words can change. And if you really understand fractions, you're confused as to why they're trying to assess you the same question just with two words switched. But if you don't understand a particular way of perceiving fractions, then that's how we understand that you can only see it as an iteration, not as a partition. Um, so I could do that, and I should do that. Uh, that would make the next uh, part stronger as well. It might not appear as a single thing, though, because it's not like people just stand up and say, now I'm envisioning this <laughs> as you know, one-fifth that could be part of, but I see that it could be part of, um, you know. Expanding the curriculum beyond six days would allow for that, uh, especially since we only had one hour. We, we planned on the curriculum lasting one hour. One of the groups was an hour and a half. Anyway. Yeah, so the kind of what started to uh, really start to shine was the idea of all the different senses. So our first research question, I would like to do a little experiment here. And I want you to please read the, uh, read the following silently.
Now, I would like to invite you to close your eyes while I read it to you. Literacy, described as the ability to read and write and colloquially perform arithmetic to achieve the three R's, is underpinned by the ability to comprehend and compose ideas in ways that are meaningful, so that it may be communicated either back to oneself or to others. You can open your eyes. Watching some of you read this, you can see you struggled. Um, I even uh, had to include the red line which gets removed when you present just in case you forgot to misspell something. Mm -hmm. But this is quite interesting because you struggled to read it. You may have even read it differently than the way I said it. But when I said it, you hear exactly what it is I'm trying to communicate. So the same idea presented in one representation is confusing, but presented in a whole different way is more powerful. In this case, what is presented to you visually, the same way math is often presented in, in school, is confusing. But now we're going to use an oral component. That was the forefront, and it becomes much easier to comprehend. We really want to work with this, and so this is what we're trying to ask when we're trying to see what the uh, resources are. So how can a micro world utilize multiple representations? We have the core for the audio, we have the sound that it's making, we have the animations, the transitions, the labels. Many different representations provide learning resources to address student misconceptions. So we want them to learn fractions, and we can know if they're learning fractions by looking at their, their descriptions. Are they able to contextualize it? Can they identify the correct things? Are they uh, <coughs> iterating? Are they separating? Or are they describing the order properly? So let's look at where math currently is. We have word problems, equations, graphical, diff graphical elements, and the always famous real world problems. And they assess them in standardized ways. Ask them to label, give them equations, or perform mental math. But where does sound of fractions fit in? The not competing, but they're different. So how do we know where to start if we want to try to figure out where sound of fractions fits in? We use those themes that we, we looked at, that we've already identified. That's a good starting point. We've already uh, done that work, so why not use it? So we're going to rearrange them. We talk, we, I showed you that the senses were very strong. So let's look at what some of those properties of senses of those senses are. So the math that the math problems that they're already presented kind of exist in this realm. Mostly visual. There are some cases, especially in remedial math, where the tangible items will be given. And then students work with them by either animating if, if they're in a digital learning environment. They'll solve equations. They might even label with stickers. <clears throat> but we introduce a completely different side, the oral and the physical, especially the embodied part. They are tapping their own rhythms. It's theirs. We don't, pose, we don't impose our music on them. They get to create it. Then we ask the question. So if we look at some of the mathematical components in this arrangement, we can see that sound of fractions supports many of these, much richer than other representations and instructions. This is how our micro world utilizes these multiple representations to address their misconceptions. 
Because you can have a misconception in one particular way, just like with the words that are arranged with literary devices intentionally meant to screw you up. But in an oral setting, things become much clearer. Yes? So are some of these items from traditional math instruction and some are from sound fractions, or is this just uh, sound fractions? Um, both. The five that were before which are ultimately yeah. right here. Those are the traditional, the tangible objects and the manipulatives, manipulables. Those can be. Um, I don't want to say it's all because we're focused on the students that are failing and those right. uh, tend to differ. And it may have, those are used early on, but those students who get it quickly put those things aside and can go yeah. straight to the equations. So this, this represents all possible ways that you know of That's right. to, to teach people fractions. And then the, the orange ones are the ones that sound of fractions is. Yes. But sound of fractions also helped you identify more of these categories to put on this in the first place. Yes. What's really neat, um, in this presentation, this is a subset of all of the different themes. We talked about how the students brought art to our attention, the gustatory. We haven't really looked into that. We would never have looked into that. We would have never even thought to look at the literature and the olfactory side as well. There's like three or four papers that briefly talk about the idea of food and math. There are no papers that talk about smell and math that I can find. Doesn't mean there exists, but it's quite clear. Thanks. <clears throat> So our second research question is how can a musical approach to fraction learning help students progress in their composition, comprehension, and communication? Really neat thing that happened uh, was we were talking about what is one? What is one rhythm? What is the number one? What happens if I write the number one this big what happens if I write the number one this big? They're both ones, but they're very different, especially in how much real estate um, we're taking up. Just luck of the draw, what is one over one? The students answer one. What's two over two? The students answer one. What's four over four? They answer one. What's 10 over 10? They answer one. 14 out of 14 came out of my head, and there were like one or two students that said one. So I increased it to 18 out of 18. It dropped about half, 21 out of 21, and there was only one student who just kept, it was more clear that he was just saying one, 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 which would have worked and we wouldn't have uh, solved this very interesting phenomenon. But this is because certain representations only they can create this misconception that one over one, if, if they're only pros with problems that are dealing with units of 10, they can solve that. They're failing to make this idea that it's a bigger abstract problem. <clears throat> Another neat thing is, when a student comes into a problem, especially if you're lower SES, you're continually faced with failure. When it's something that you just don't get, you give up. That didn't happen with us. When we posed a math question with a rhythm that they created that was rather complex, or at least theirs, the math problem was out of their reach. They reduced the complexity of their music so that they could attempt to solve the math problem. They did this without us test telling them. They tapped five beats, they made, they made a rhythm with three. They tapped 10, they made a rhythm with five. Still couldn't get it, they reduced it to three. There's problems, mathematical problems, when you reduce it to one. We would help them not uh, reduce it that, that far. But they have their own agency that allowed them, and they have their skill set in one domain, the musical domain, that they can then change so they, they can approach the mathematical problem. So which, which comes first? If you ask them what comes first, a rhythm, the second beat of a rhythm with five, or the second beat with a rhythm of four? 
That's extremely complex. That was like the second time we did it. We started with which comes first, the second beat of three or the second beat of four? And they, so it's neat because we can refer to it as the green beat. The second beat is green always in our representation from our color choices. So we can say, what, which green beat plays first? That's a musical question to directly get to the mathematical uh, question of which comes first. You ask a student, how many beats are in that rhythm that you just tapped? tapped. Sometimes they would talk about all of them. Most of the times they would say, they would describe either the beats that were on or the beats that were off. This is very different than some of the questions that are in math books that are shaded, which are drawing your attention to one, because they don't know what the unshaded is. Here, they can't, they still can give weight to that rest, because it is something that they're feeling inside, as an embodied, uh, or an entrained feeling. And then, what is a fraction? Since we've approach this with these stages that talk about creation, identification, and manipulation across different domains or con and different contexts, domains being mathematical or musical, and contexts giving different situations of music. They're starting to learn the more abstract approaches, or at minimum, an internal function or approach or steps that they can take a mathematical problem, turn it into a musical problem, answer it musically, and then bring it back to a math problem. And for our final research question, how do multiple interactive culturally relevant activities affect engagement? Simply, you ask them, they love it. They absolutely love it. Um, Drake's tapping, and Alan is like, giddy. Absolutely loves it. We asked this day two, day four or five, and day six and seven. It's, I love the music, I love tapping, I like the computer. Now some of those, I'll play devil's advocate here, some of it is they don't get computer time, so that's it. That's something. This is also a different class, so it's different. Doesn't matter that it's novel, it's just different. That also could be the case. But just looking at their faces, you can tell that it, there's that definitely positive valence associated with um, their answers. We give them multiple representations, both graphical in the sound of fractions, oral with different instruments, and then just it's a different sense that we're also doing. We have this bead representation, and there's the list of all these different characteristics that the bead elicits. What's really interesting is it take at least F1, at least a characteristic is tied to another representation or another mathematical meaning. It's the central point of all of these representations. It's clear to see it in the music to see it in the bar, the pie, and the line, the more standard mathematical representations. <clears throat> and since we chose to take the audio and put it in a circular um, representation, it helps students move from something that's cognitive, embodied, and entrained, and internal, into a more external graphical, visual, and mathematical representation. And our representations are rich, both graphically, orally, all these different domains. And then we allow them to transition between them. So they can see what's conserved, what's not, what's important, what's not. The parts, the holes, at the same time. This is uh, a slide not, not going to spend too much time on, but uh, we have some of our technical contributions, especially how to actually unroll that line 
or that <laughs> read into a line. Um, some notes for other people that are interested in uh, educating. Uh, the things that you really have to take into consideration when we're working with uh, administrators, teachers, school systems, and also when we're working with, uh, with students. These are very important, uh, especially as a participatory or a participating researcher. Uh, it's hard to wear both hats, and you have to switch them off and on. Um, The future work, specifically with this study, um, one look at the log data, um, we could go, uh, it wouldn't take much work to turn it into quantitative data. Um, the video data still needs further thematic evaluation, as Deborah pointed out, um, and a better progression from one, uh, or as the steps move as I move between the steps of analysis. Um, we have to consider some of the headaches that deal with larger scale deployment. Um, I can't be in every single place at once, nor can any single uh, facilitator. So how do we provide resources for the teachers? And how can we have other um, manipulatives or devices. So what happens if we were to throw this on an iPad or you can touch it? Um, it would make it more appealable or uh, approachable for uh, the school systems. Plus you get the tactile feedback. Um, it's something we don't uh, currently deal with with sound diffractions is different sized beats. Um, we handle that by taking the greatest common denominator of the uh, representations to keep it in a unit fraction, since we want to start with it, uh, uh, that mathematical concept. So if you had a, an iPad where they're touching and holding longer, you could interpret for multiple beat sizes. So this work, it's a lot of work. I appreciate your uh, dealing with the multiple slide presentation. That's how I tried to, to keep this as short as possible. Um, it's compelling. It's really, it really is, and the students love it. That first and foremost is a win for everybody. Um, if you keep the students interested, there's a much higher chances of actually communicating something effectively. Uh, we created this thing, this this interface, and the curriculum to go with. Those happen at the same time in order to see the parts and the holes at the same time. It's embodied. When do you get to stand up and do something? I loved physics uh, labs because it's not sitting in a book. I think most of us enjoy using our bodies to uh, accompany uh, learning. There's a representational infrastructure that we added. It's very difficult to, uh, to, to implement, but I think we did a uh, good job. We have uh, the different ways that they're represented, and ultimately we move them towards more uh, mathematically uh, common representations. That's it. Does anyone have questions?